folks, and welcome to this program as part of Wilson County Public Library's 2020 Summer Reading Program, Imagine Your Story. Imagine your story can mean a lot of things, but sometimes it can mean imagining yourself inside the story. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm reading Jane Austen or watching a big screen movie adaptation, all I can think of is those beautiful clothes and how wonderful it would be to get to dress up like those people and, and experience the feeling and the weight of those clothes and the beauty of those garments. Well, the good news is you can. It, welcome to the wonderful world of historical costuming. Now, historical costuming can be from any era. Today, I've decided to focus on the Outlander era, AKA the 18th century. Now, when I say 18th century, what I'm gonna narrow it down to is about the 1730s, 40s, up to around about 1780. That's the time period with, where people think of when they think of the 18th century. Um, if you're thinking of Outlander, definitely if you're thinking of the American Revolution, again, that's your 18th century style. There were variations on the style of the garments throughout that period, but the overall silhouette stayed fairly standard and the parts and the way the costumes were composed stayed fairly standard. So today is, what if I was in Outlander? What would I wear if I was an everyday person in the world of the Outlander? So 18th century, you're thinking big white wigs and wide hoop skirts. Well, hate to disappoint you, but that's not everyday style. That would be like if you wore a prom dress to go to the grocery store. Not what everybody was wearing. I'm gonna do three different everyday wardrobes. I'm gonna do one for working class, what most people were actually wearing. Gonna do one for middle class, so like a lady who ran a shop maybe, or an innkeeper. And then I'm gonna do one for upper class, maybe your local landed gentry. And you'll get to see, step by step, what those garments are composed of. So I'm gonna start with lower class. These are very basic garments. Think of this as the jeans and t-shirt of the 18th century for women. Um, now, one thing to remember about 18th century costume is that everybody wore the same kind of clothes. So the dress that the maid wore is the same dress that the lady of the house wore. The difference is the fabric. 18th century, it's all about the fabric because the fabric shows how wealthy you are. Part of that is the makeup of the fabric. If you're a poor local farmer, you're probably gonna be wearing wool and linen. But if you are a fancy lady going to a ball, silk's where it's at. Now, not just the quality of the fabric, but also the quantity of the fabric is very important. When it comes to clothes, you today, hand-sewn clothing, all the money is in the labor. Not the way back then. The labor was cheap. The money was in the fabric itself. So the more fabric you wore, the richer you were. So whereas the lower classes might have economical fabric choices, in the upper classes it was all about showing as much fabric as you could. Well, let's start off. If I was a working class woman, what would I wear? Well, the good news is, first I start with the same set of undergarments for everybody, whether they're lower class, upper class, it doesn't matter. You're gonna start with three basic undergarments. First off is your shift. That is what you're seeing here. It's this shirt-like garment that goes to about the knee. It runs underneath the corset. It serves two purposes. It provides a, a layer to bulk out, um, provide a protective layer between me and my outer clothing. Um, it also serves as a way to keep my clothing clean and also almost to clean me. They didn't bathe as much in the 18th century, not by choice, but because they didn't have running water or handy conveniences like hot water heaters. But they still wanted to be clean, so you, every day you would change your shift. Your shift would be made out of linen. Doesn't matter if you were poor or rich, linen is where it's at for shifts. It's cool, it's comfortable, it washes and wears very well. And part of the function of the shift was as you wore it, you got cleaner as your shift got dirtier. And so you take off your dirty shift at the end of the day, 
and you'd be cleaner as a result. And also, it provides a protective layer that keeps your corset clean, keeps your outer clothing clean. You don't have to wash that stuff as often. So I start with my shift. Over the shift goes my corset, or as it was called in the 18th century, a pair of stays. You'll see that it laces up the front. It does not tight lace. Myth number one, tight lacing was not a thing in the 18th century. That's a 19th century thing. In the 18th century, the corset served, the stays served as a support garment. And let me tell you, it's an awesome support garment. Check out that back support. Don't need any kind of back brace in the 18th century. Um, and it also provided a firm, fixed shape to your body to mount your outer clothing on. And you'll see that later, how that comes into play. Um, it, fit, it is designed to fit my body. It is not designed to constrict my body. So while definitely you can tell you're wearing it, it's not terribly uncomfortable. It's actually kind of comfortable. It does all the work for your posture for you. So uh, it's not, when they write about ladies fainting all the time, that is not the 18th century. Everybody wore stays. Doesn't matter if you were working on a farm or in a shop or whatever, you wore stays. Um, it, would, it was very scandalous to not have stays. Um, you were a loose woman. Now, the material of your stays might vary. Um, you might, uh, upper class women would have nice silk stays bound with, uh, that were bone with whalebone. That's the bone that keeps the stays straight and firm. Um, if you were a little cheaper, you might have it bone with reed, uh, actual grass reeds that provided that support. Uh, if you were very poor, you might actually just have stays that were cut out of a piece of stiff leather. But, so I have my shift on, I have my stays on. My last basic underlayer is my petticoat. Everybody would have at least one petticoat. Uh, you might wear more over, if it was winter time, you might have three or four petticoats lay, uh, layered. Uh, your under petticoat would usually be linen. You might have one that's wool or one that's um, silk. If, because petticoat is the name of the skirt, it doesn't, we think of petticoat as being an undershirt, as being a slip. Uh, petticoat is just the overall name for the type of skirt, and you had a petticoat as part of your outer skirt. Uh, so that would be showing at all times. So your outer petticoat might be wool, it might be silk, it might be printed cotton. Okay, so I've got on my basic underlayers. I've also got on a pair of socks. Nice knee-high socks, usually would be tied with ribbon garters and some very basic black leather shoes with a metal buckle. Uh, most of your poor folks would have worn very simple leather shoes if they had shoes at all, and they might have tied them with a ribbon if they couldn't afford buckles. Uh, buckles were nice though because you could buy one pair of buckles and transfer it to your next pair of shoes, to your next pair of shoes, to your next pair of shoes. They were, they're designed to be removed and put on a different pair of shoes, so that's the nice thing about buckles. You can invest in buckles one time and have a set to last your lifetime. So, first thing I'm actually gonna put on, and this goes for all of my ladies, is my pockets. 18th century has awesome pockets. Let me tell you that, the best. Anytime you have a, you know, try on a pair of jeans and they actually have a halfway decent pair of pockets, doesn't have a patch on the 18th century. The pockets are a separate garment that ties on over your under petticoat, and they're huge. You can fit so much in these things. I've actually fit takeout containers full of dinner in these. They're awesome. So you have your pair of pockets. Now the first actual clothing item that I'm going to put on is my over petticoat. This is my outer petticoat that's going to be part of my finished outer costume. Because I am lower plex, it's going to be made out of a very sturdy, slightly heavyweight linen. I am interested in a fabric that's going to wear well for a lifetime. The shape of the petticoat is basically a couple of long rectangles sewn together and then pleated to a waistband. And it comes into two halves, your back half, and your front half. And you just tie it on like that. Tie on your back half first, and then you tie on your front half. Tuck 
because of how it ties on, those wide slits at the side give me easy access to my pockets. It's a great design, very practical. So I've got on my outer petticoat. I'm also going to put something else on right now. You may notice I have a little bit of a modesty panel here. That's because the 18th century has to deal with the bosom problem. This is a problem that you have on all women's clothing. Men's clothing, you can just do a straight rectangle. Women have some shape. Different eras have dealt with it in different ways. Um, for instance, right now we tend to have a lot of princess seaming, which has a seam that comes up here and then curves. Uh, in the Regency period, they have little high waists and just a lot of times a gathered portion across here. 18th century solves the problem by just cutting off the garments right at the point. So they don't have to worry about shaping it over because the garment stops there. Now the downside of that is that it makes for a slightly indecent amount visible. So a fundamental part of all 18th century women's clothing was a neckerchief, a ruffle, a fichu, something that fills in this neckline and keeps you decent. That is the number one thing that you will notice if you're watching Outlander, is that's the number one inaccuracy that bugs me. None of the ladies wear anything at their neck. They're just running around with it all hanging out. And that is not what you would have done at all. So I am taking my fichu and I am just pinning them in place. I could just tuck it. Just pinning it to keep it in place. So I've got my fichu ready to go. Now the next part of my very basic laboring class clothing, this is probably the most common garment of the era. And it's the one that you're not going to see on the screen because there's nothing glamorous about it. This is the jeans and t-shirt of the 18th century. This is called a bed gown. also sometimes known as a short gown. Despite being called a bed gown, it has nothing to do with the actual bed. You wouldn't be wearing this as part of your pajamas. This is the basic upper garment of the era. It's a, a T-shape with a few little pleats. It's very economical fabric-wise. Everything that you cut off in one area, you use in another part of this garment. So every little bit of the fabric gets used. There's no waste. It's very easy to make. It's one, a kind of a one six shape fits all, so there's no fancy fitting involved. You can churn out a bunch of these in one sitting. In fact, they were very popular sewing for the upper ladies to sew. For the poor deserving souls, they would sew a lot of these because they are kind of interchangeably sized. And they also are designed to be very easy to put on and off. They're loose. They're very comfortable and practical. They don't restrict your movement like some of the other styles. Some of the other styles have very tight sleeves. Not so this. And this is, so I just pull it on for my shift. Pull it across. And for closure, pins. This is where the stays come in very handy. It provides a, a fixed shape to your body, and it also provides a great foundation to pin into. This is why you could close your clothing with pins without being scared about stabbing yourself, because there's a quarter inch of whalebone between you and the pins, and you aren't the least bit worried. So just pull across the front part, then pull across the second part, pin it into place. Now, they did also use hooks and eyes for common weight clothes clothing. A lot of times you see that, especially on gowns, um, more so than jackets. Buttons, not so much. You'd see buttons on men's coats, but you really wouldn't see buttons on women's clothing. Also, on exterior garments, you would not see lacing. Lacing is for stays, lacing is for undergarments, lacing is not for closing your outer garment. Now, the one exception to that is you would have sometimes uh, a separate bodice piece in the middle, and that would sometimes you would have decorative lacing across that, but that's about the only place you would see lacing. So here we are. This is my finished laboring class outfit. Notice the wide sleeves, 
good range of movement. And this is something you'll notice throughout the aging century. One of those changes in silhouette that I mentioned is the sleeves start off very big. This would be suitable wide sleeves for about the 1740s when in Outlander they were having the Jacobite Rebellion. Um, you'll see that the sleeves get tighter as we move towards more the American Revolution period. When, once we hit that, the sleeves are quite snug. In fact, I have to wear a different kind of shift because these full bulky sleeves will not fit under those more recent sleeves. Something else I might wear with this, if it's cold, I might like just a pair of practical warm mitts. Knitted mittings, you would see these fairly often. That's about the only place you would really see knitting was in mitts. Uh, stockings and mitts, you wouldn't see knitted scarves, you wouldn't see like a knitted jacket, definitely not, no sweaters. But mitts were popular. And if it was winter, I might also want, remember, I'm lower class, I can't afford a nice fancy cake, but I can wrap myself up in a nice warm shawl. Notice also that I have my cap on. I'm a good modest lady, I will always have my cap on. To be honest, if I was labor in class, I probably wouldn't have quite as fancy of a hairdo, but I would always have my cap. This one's a very plain, coarse linen cap, but it has a bit of ruffle for fun. And just because I'm laboring class, just because I'm laboring class doesn't mean that I don't like my pretty things. So you'll notice that I can't afford much of that fancy new printed cotton fabric, but I got just a little bit to decorate my sleeves with. And on my cap, I might at the fair buy a bit of ribbon and put that on my cap to be pretty. So that is the basic clothing of the laboring class in the 18th century. Next up, middle class. Part two of 18th century clothing for women, middle class. So these are the people who still may work fit, but are not laborers. So you might be a shop owner, you might own your own tavern, you might be maybe a school teacher. These are the people who have to do some work, but not too much. So you can get a little fancier with clothing, you probably have a little more money, you can afford slightly nicer fabrics. So you'll, if you've been paying close attention, you may have noticed a couple of slight changes to my outfit already. I've got a different shift on. That's because this costume is slightly later in the 1700s with the narrower sleeves, so I have to have a narrower sleeve shift to compensate. I also, because I'm a slightly higher class, have a slightly nicer cap in a lighter, better woven fabric. Um, so this is just a little bit of an upgrade from before. And I'm gonna go with one of the most popular middle class outfits, the petticoat and jacket. This was a very popular choice. Gowns were also very popular, so you'll see a gown next. Um, and certainly they were wearing a lot of gowns at this point too, in the middle class. But uh, petticoat and jacket is a very versatile combination. It lets you mix and match your wardrobe so you get more bang for your buck money-wise. It also means that you can make a jacket out of a more expensive fabric and use less of that fabric so you can get something really pretty but not have to invest in the amount of fabric that would need for a full, uh, full gown and petticoat. So we're going up a little bit in our fabric from our previous choice. Previously we had somewhat coarse linen and uh, somewhat coarse bold lined in linen with maybe a little bit of printed fabric. Now I've gone up to a nicer linen. This particular linen I'm using is a shot linen, which is to say that the weft threads are one color and the work threads are another color. In this case, yellow and red making a very vibrant orange. Don't think that they didn't like color th at this time. They certainly did. Now, definitely there were plenty of people wearing floor length skirts at the time. Those people were gentry. Those people were of the upper class. They did not have to work for a living. And anytime you see somebody running around in a farm field in a floor length skirt, get suspicious. 
Most people were wearing skirts about ankle length, sometimes up to even calf length. It's very practical and it lets you not get those hems all muddy. If you were wearing something that was floor length or heaven forbid had a train, you were wearing that indoors. You were wearing that maybe at a garden party where you had to take one or two turns on the gravel. You were not wearing that to slop up the pigs. So I've got on my petticoat and the next part of my costume, oh, before I put on the jacket, Oh, and here's the fun thing I forgot to mention earlier. This goes in my corset. This is called a bosque. And if you think, what the heck? Why is she shoving a piece of wood down her front? How is that comfortable? Believe it or not, this actually does make the corset more comfortable. It maintains that straight posture that they were all about. And it spreads the pressure out. So instead of having the pressure hit right at your waist, it's spread out. and the comfort level just goes up a notch as soon as you slide that busk in. Busks were a very popular uh, gift from sweethearts to their young ladies. And if you see where the busk lives, you can guess why. So then I'm also going to put on my fichu because I'll not be caught dead in public without it. Let me just go ahead and tuck that into my skirt. Nice big fichu here. You can also tie the fichu on over your jacket if you prefer not to have it tucked under. That was perfectly acceptable too. I like the look of it tucked under. And now comes my jacket. This jacket is made in a printed cotton. These were the big new thing towards the middle and later 18th century. Printed cottons were imported from India early on and then they were, began to be printed in Europe and England. Um, they, were pricier, but they were achievably pricey. So, whereas my lower class person could only afford enough to make a little pretty cuff, my middle class person could certainly afford enough for a nice jacket. It's lined in linen, of course, everything is lined in linen. Once again, it just pins on. And another one of those fun myths is everybody was wearing homespun. That is not true. Anytime you're thinking of all those colonial area ladies weaving their own cotton at home, and wearing dresses made out of cotton that they'd grown on their farm, that is not happening. If anybody was wearing the locally made fabric, it would be very poor folks, possibly the enslaved population would be wearing it. Um, but most of your fabric, most of your cotton is sent over to England or to Europe, turned into fabric, and sent back to you to buy. So imported fabric was absolutely the way to go didn't just import fabric. They would import finished garments. They import job lots of finished shoes. So they would advertise that they got in a whole lot of shoes ready to wear. A lot of this stuff was actually made overseas and imported. So that's not actually that big of a change today. <laughs> there we are. I have got on my jacket and my petticoat. I'm ready to go to town. Now, because I am middle class, I might be doing a little bit of laboring, in which case, an apron will be a good thing to have. Helps protect my pretty fabrics. And as a fashion statement in and of itself, ladies of all classes wore aprons. The difference is that the upper class ladies wore them as ornaments. They were made out of fancy, fine silks and covered in ruffles. Whereas mine is a much more practical green linen that will not show too much wear. Again with the pins. It's all about the pins in 18th century clothing. I don't know if I've got my apron off. Now, if it were winter time, I'd probably be wearing a couple more petticoats. And the ubiquitous outer garment would have been a woolen cloak. I don't have a mid-range woolen cloak to show you here today, but you'll get to see an upper-class woolen cloak here in a bit. 
That's it for middle class. Let's move on to upper class. And now part three, upper class clothing. So once again, the big difference is fabric. Please spot the difference on what I'm wearing here. Definitely see the difference in the cap. This is a silk cap, much finer material, much fancier. You'll also see a difference in the fabric on my feet. I have fancy cream colored shoes, much less practical for everyday wear finer silver buckles, and I am wearing clocked stockings. Clocking has nothing to do with time. Clocked refers to the patterns woven in on each side. So I'm already starting off my underlayers a lot fancier than the other ladies. Now, I am a very fashionable lady, of course, so I want that fashionable silhouette. I want that teeny tiny waist. But didn't I say that they don't take pipe lace in the 18th century? That's right. So how do I get a teeny tiny waist? By making my hips enormous. I have all kinds of options for what kind of thick hips I want to wear. Let's see. Am I feeling hippier today? Or am I feeling a little more out the back? I think I'll go with this one. That just ties on over my petticoat. Maybe it's her, maybe it's a bit of horse hair and a bustle. Next in my fancier fabric, I'm gonna get really fancy, and I am going to have a quilted petticoat. These were usually made out of silk, quilted to a wool base, and they involved lots of hand stitches, so you would have to have a fair bit of money to afford this. Much nicer fabric. And they're wonderful in winter. They're very, very warm. And they also provide a lot of body and structure. So I'm going to put on my quilted petticoat. Now, a lot of times gowns would have a matching petticoat. So my print gown would have a petticoat of the same printed fabric. That was extremely common. Probably actually more common than having of a different fabric. But in this case, I'm going to show off my fancy quilted petticoat. And you'll notice how my skirt is much longer than in my previous example. That's because, again, I am not going to be out there slopping the pigs. I am a lady of leisure, and I shouldn't be encountering anything that should cause too much mud to my nose. Look at that. Between the quilting and that little bit of extra padding, teeny tiny waist. Now, what goes over that? is my gown. Gowns tend to have the same general basic shape. You'll notice that this is not going over wide side hoops. It doesn't have the big fall of fabric in the back. That was really a court style, a very upper class style. Um, definitely like Martha Washington would have worn it. But your average everyday wear would not be. And this, what this is is everyday wear. So I'm going to have a much more basic gown, but you'll notice it's got a lot of fabric in it, and it's made out of a pricey printed cotton, very fashionable. So in this case, rather than going with a lighter color, I am wearing a practical dark brown. You'll notice something else about it, which is that I have a ruffle on my sleeves and on my neckline. This is what I can wear if I don't want a neckerchief. I can certainly just wear a nice neck ruffle instead. You would have a set of ruffles, and they can be easily pinned into any dress and moved to another dress, so it would not be a permanent part of the dress. The back has a piece of boning down it, so to get it to conform nice and tight to my waist, I have a hidden ribbon. I just tie that to snug in that back. And 
now I bet you can't guess what I'm going to do next. You're right, I'm going to pin it in place. You see all of the fabric that's in the skirt. There's usually a good seven yards in one of these dresses, up to maybe ten yards. And of course, if you're talking about one of those big hooped and panniers jobs, 15 yards. So you can see how it's advertising that I can afford a lot of fabric. I'll pin it into place and tuck my ruffle around here. ready for a trip that helped in the country, maybe? Now, accessories, of course, make the lady. Here's some mitts again, but my mitts this time are fine linen with embroidery. Wool or silk, we are also popular for mitts. They're cut on the bias, which means that even the woven fabric is sufficiently stretchy to get over your hands. It's a little snug. Pull it up. It's a very popular accessory for ladies. And I also might want a lovely hat. Straw hats were very, very, very popular. Uh, probably more so than any other hat. Though a lot of times you wouldn't see the straw because it might be covered in silk. A bit of ribbon. That's the trick. Stack that on the hat pin. And then just maybe tie it in the back of my cap. So that is a uh, basic upper class everyday gown and petticoat combination. This would be quite suitable for most everyday occasions. This would, the quilted petticoat would definitely make this be more of a winter outfit. And because it's a winter outfit, I might want some overclothing. In this case, I might want a nice red cardinal cape. Red wool cardinal capes were the most popular outerwear. Think of the yellow raincoat. The ubiquitous outer layer of the 18th century was definitely the red cardinal cape. And you can tell this is an upper class cardinal because not only is it longer, using more fabric again, but it also has luxurious shag trim, which makes it bit fancier than what your middle class person might be wearing. You see those hooks and eyes I was talking about? 100% period correct. Definitely you could wear hooks and eyes. Have a nice full hood. Very, very warm. I have a little capelet. It helps keep the rain off. And if I'm getting really fancy about it, if I'm getting really fancy about it, I'll have some matching woolen knits. And then to keep my hands really warm, a nice muff. You can definitely see how this would not be something you would wear if you were working class because you need to have your hands busy to do so. So a nice warm muff to keep your hands warm. Just the thing for a long trip. 
And those are the basics of 18th century everyday clothing. Now you're probably wondering, how do you get started in a hobby like this? Well, I have good news for you. If you are interested in exploring the world of clothing, and especially 18th century clothing, there are some fantastic resources out there. And I'm going to mention just two books today. Now, we don't own these in the library collection, but if you think we should, let us know. Book number one is The 18th Century Guide to Dressmaking by American Duchess. Uh, this is a very recent publication, and it is an excellent beginner's guide. It has step-by-step step, step -step illustrations and samples of some of the most common garments of the era. Uh, another nice thing about American Duchess is that she worked with simplicity patterns to make a line of 18th century patterns, and if you go to her blog, there are instructions on how to adapt those simplicity patterns to work with this book. So this is a great beginner's way to get into historic costume. For the slightly more in-depth researcher, Colonial Williamsburg's Costume Clue Close-Up by Linda Baumgartner. This is more for your historian, but it's fantastic. It has extant existing garments that have survived from the era with photos and diagrams of how they are shaped. So if you're a little more adventurous and want to try making your own pattern from scratch, or just really want to know how the clothes were actually made, Costume close-up is a great place to go. I hope you enjoyed this attempt to imagine ourselves into the everyday world of the Outlander, and join us for the rest of the 2020 summer reading program and imagine your story.